seen Amsterdam's famous canal houses many times. They are known for being cute, narrow, and charmingly uniquely Dutch. What you probably don't associate them with is the genesis of modern capitalism. Let me explain. Now, if you're like me, you might be thinking, ew, capitalism? Doesn't capitalism only create bland cookie cutter suburban homes? It does do that. But as much as I hate to admit it, it also created these. That's right, capitalism somehow created some of the cutest houses in the world. Like these houses are so cute that they're UNESCO World Heritage Certified Cute. How, like how did that happen? <laughs> Let's figure it out. We'll start by establishing what exactly a canal house is. Well, um, it's on a canal, that's easy. They're almost always made out of brick and they're tall, narrow, and deep. The outside of the building is called a tautaville or spout facade. What this means is that the facade comes together at a point here called a gable. Sometimes the front of the building will have a decorative gable on the street side. This is called a Dutch gable. On the back side, which is usually the canal side, there's a functional spout gable. So we have the canal, the shape, and all these gables. Why? Why are these houses so specific? Q, capitalism. Before canal houses, there were corporations. One super massive global corporation, to be exact. The Vereine de Oost Indische Compagnie, also known as the VOC, also known as the Dutch East India Company. The VOC was the first international corporation in the world. It was founded in 1602 and its activities quite literally created economics as we know it, from the stock market to globalization to modern bureaucracy itself. Basically, the VOC took whatever goods they wanted, mostly spices, from around the world. If local populations resisted this process, the VOC enslaved them, killed them, and took their lands as Dutch colonies. The VOC took specialized goods from all over the world, like Anatolian mohair, Indian fabrics, French grapes and Polish grain, and enmeshed them into a globalized system of trade that went back and forth across the world, and it stored them all in Amsterdam. This storage was a problem. Amsterdam was small and it was being used quite literally as a storehouse for the world. So the answer to this problem came in the form of canal houses. Most classic canal houses were built in the early 1600s during the VOC's rise to global domination. The outermost canal is called Prinsengrach and it was designed specifically for shipping all of these goods back and forth. The buildings surrounding the canal, the canal houses, were warehouses slash homes for merchants of the city. The houses were positioned canal side for easy storage. Goods to be stored were shipped from the port up the canal right to the front door of the warehouses. Then they were hoisted up to the middle floor of the canal house using a rope and pulley attached to that spout cable. You can still see metal hooks hanging from some of these beams and people still move furniture this way. A vast array of products were stored this way. Cinnamon, sugar, tea, beer, silk, soap, tobacco, whale oil, fish. In 1626, VOC warehouses were storing almost six million pounds of pepper alone. Canal houses were warehouses, but they were also shops and homes. They typically had a workshop just below street level and a showroom to meet with customers just above that. You could access the shop by walking up a few steps to the stoop or stoop in Dutch. <laughs> Some of the doorways are marked by a carved gable stone with a picture indicating what the merchant who lived there did, like a sheet for a shepherd. And some of these got extremely elaborate. The upper floors of the canal house were where the merchant and his family actually lived. This was private space. And the distinction was marked by people taking their shoes off, not when they entered the building, but when they crossed over to these floors that the family actually inhabited. Two other aspects of canal houses make them really unique compared to other European housing at the time. First, they were designed for one family to live in, meaning two parents and their children. This sounds super obvious, like 
duh, this is a house, but this is not how people lived at the time. They lived in multi-generational households or they lived where they worked with a lot of other unrelated people. For the first time, the canal house is the type of house that equates where you live with your family. Secondly, the canal house put the rich and uh, everyone else on a relatively equal playing field. In other European cities, the mansions of the rich were huge, sometimes taking up entire blocks. In Amsterdam, the rich lived in narrow canal houses, just like everybody else. Yeah, richer residents may have been more likely to live directly on the canal, but the neighborhoods as a whole were actually really integrated in a way that was very unprecedented at the time. The rich also had fewer servants than their other European counterparts, since a lot of servants just wouldn't fit in the canal houses. And these servants actually ate their meals with the family, which further flattened class distinctions. All of this doesn't mean that rich people's canal houses weren't fancy. They absolutely were. Some of them were even referred to as little palaces. But their size, the conception of home, and who they lived next to was a fundamental shift in how the rich should interact with the rest of the world. So that's how capitalism shaped the canal house. It demanded that limited space in a small city be used not for displays of wealth, but for creating more wealth as efficiently as possible. Worldwide exploitation created a lot of stuff that needed to be warehoused. The VOC extracted way more than any society could ever conceivably dream of consuming at tremendous cost to the rest of the world. But we got cute houses. <laughs> I wish that I had a happier conclusion for you, but a lot of these stories get darker the deeper that you go. And all we can really do is educate ourselves, try to do better, and appreciate small moments of beauty where we can find them. Like a painstakingly, adorably carved Dutch gable on a canal house in a bustling city. Thank you so much for watching. This video was brought to you by Bright Trip. Bright Trip is an online learning community created for curious travelers who want to learn more about the world, explore new places, learn new skills, and continue learning about histories, cuisines, and cultures. There are a bunch of amazing new courses that I can't wait to check out, like the Adventure Cats Guide and the Guide to Filipino Food. I'm also really excited for Wines and Vineyards by Libby Simon Brody. I'm from a wine region, but I'm honestly pretty dumb about wine, so I'm really excited to learn more about the flavors and how to identify them instead of just being like, huh, it tastes like wine. Bright Trip is designed for acquiring skills just like that to help you continue your lifelong learning. There are a ton of different courses being added every month and so many different topics to suit your learning desires. Bright Trip courses use stunning visuals alongside educational animations to help you learn. You can find all of this and so much more on brighttrip.com and I will see you next time.